Bona tarda a tothom i molt benvinguts i benvingudes al seminari La crisi de la sobirania a Europa, que organitza el CIDOP conjuntament amb el Centre d'Estudis de Temes Contemporanis i com a president del CIDOP voldria destacar aquesta la col·laboració que tenim amb el Centre d'Estudis de Temes Contemporanis i també el suport que ens dona en aquesta ocasió el diari Ara i l'Institut de Governança Democràtica, Governants, i desitjar fermament que aquest seminari que ara comencem i aquestes col·laboracions que també ens atem tinguin continuïtat i siguin profitoses. Aquest seminari ens ocuparà aquesta tarda i continuarà demà al matí. Compta amb experts de renom internacionals que reflexionaran sobre la crisi de la sobirania a Europa. El que està en crisi és el model tradicional de sobirania a les relacions internacionals que assumia que els estats eren sobirans. Durant la Guerra Freda es veia els estats com unes caixes negres on no importava el que hi havia dins seu i res del que hi havia fora les podia penetrar. Com a mínim des dels anys 90, la globalització, l'economia global, la cooperació internacional, els organismes supranacionals, les intervencions humanitàries, també denominades a vegades ingerència humanitària, els processos de desintegració d'estats o propostes d'autodeterminació, així com les emergències climàtiques, han fet que el model tradicional de sobirania sigui caduc. En comptes de caixes negres, avui veiem els estats com a caixes perforades. En termes polítics, el dictamen de l'Acord Suprema del Canadà de 1998 i la posterior llei de claretat de 1999 assenyalen un abans i un després, ja que per primera vegada es legisla sobre la possibilitat d'iniciar un procés de cessació o de segregació d'un territori d'un estat català de dret i democràtic, diferenciant el denominat dret a decidir del dret d'autodeterminació propi dels processos de descolonització, que no era el cas del Quebec. La llei de claretat va servir d'inspiració en el cas del referèndum de cessació plantejat pel govern escocès i pactat, acord de l'octubre l'any 2012, amb el govern del Regne Unit. El referèndum d'Escòcia, que va tenir lloc el setembre de 2014, complia, doncs, amb les dues exigències bàsiques de la llei de claretat. L'aplicació del principi democràtic per acord bilateral i una pregunta clara i concisa. Indirectament, la llei de claretat també és una referència en el procés de separació de Montenegro de l'ex-Jugoslàvia, o hauríem de dir ja pràcticament de Sèrbia, però en aquests moments només quedaven Sèrbia i Montenegro de l'ex-Jugoslàvia. No així en el cas de Kosovo, que va anar per un procés o per una via diferent. A l'Europa d'avui, la contestació de la sobirania ve tant de dalt com de baix, començant per casa nostra, on a més del procés de Catalunya, la ciutat de Barcelona reclama més projecció internacional i estableix xarxes de cooperació amb altres ciutats, una projecció que estava tradicionalment reservada als estats. Des de dalt, la Unió Europea reclama que els estats membres cedeixin sobirania per a una unió política, social i econòmica, per fer un projecte comú, però el Brexit o els partits de dretes eurocètics evidencien que, per contra, moltes veus desitgen reforçar la sobirania als estats. Aquestes qüestions les discutirem sobretot aquesta tarda. Paral·lelament, l'apoderament polític de la ciutadania dona lloc a fenòmens molt diversos, no necessàriament ideològicament homogenis, i es troba darrere de processos tan diferents com el moviment dels indignats, el procés català o les fracassades, excepte en el cas de Tunísia, revoltes per la dignitat àrabs. La crisi de la sobirania, però, no és només política. També és una crisi social, en part provocada per processos econòmics globals que s'allunyen dels processos locals i de les necessitats de la gent. És per això que demà parlarem de la sobirania com una qüestió social i econòmica, on la gent demana apoderar-se i recuperar el control. 
Si hi ha una idea que pot servir com a punt de partida pels seminaris, la de veure i pensar com en l'Europa d'avui la sobirania està deixant pas a les sobiranies, en plural, a les sobiranies compartides. Voldria agrair-los a tots vostès la seva presència aquí aquesta tarda i els convido a que tornin a venir per descomptat demà al matí, en la segona part d'aquest seminari. Voldria també agrair a tots els que han fet possible aquest seminari, tant els membres del CIDOP com de les institucions amb les quals col·laborem, i especialment no puc deixar de mencionar a Paul Vergés que hagués que m'ha conduït una mica amb el contingut del seminari per poder dir aquestes poques paraules que he dit ara. Ara passaré la paraula a la secretària d'Acció Exterior i de la Unió Europea de la Generalitat de Catalunya, Mireia Borrell Porta, que ens parlarà de la visió europeista de Catalunya amb la presentació del Pla Europa. Moltes gràcies a tots vostès per ser avui aquí. Moltes gràcies, president Antoni, per la càlida benvinguda. És sempre un plaer venir aquí al CIDOP i també agraeixo molt la col·laboració entre la Generalitat i el CIDOP, en aquest cas, més específicament des de la Generalitat, el Centre d'Estudis de Temes Contemporanis. Um, I very much appreciate such a distinguished group of speakers and panelists for accepting our invitation to come here in Barcelona to have this very relevant and we think very timely as well discussion. Uh, we, we are thrilled also of this splendid turnout and um, I, I look forward listening to uh, what this impressive group of speakers have to say on this relevant topic and also the discussions that hopefully will, will follow up. I myself, as uh, uh, the president of CIDOP has said, would like to make a few comments on how we see the situation um, and, and, and our remarks on Europe. Since this administration took office, one of our priorities has been the relationship with the European Union that we think needs to be renovated. Um, I myself love Europe. It's, it's part of me, it's part of my identity, my history, my culture, also my education, um, uh, which was uh, in, in Great Britain, maybe not in the European Union for long, but surely in, in Europe. And I'm not alone. Um, Catalans have always looked up at Europe with admiration, with relief, with pride to be part of a community of citizens that cherish and fights for human rights, fights for freedom, for respect of minorities, and so, and so on. So it's, in a nutshell, it's the values of uh, the founding fathers that Catalans have always looked up to. Um, and, of course, there's been uh, a, somehow a disappointment after the 1st of October in 2017, uh, after the sort of non-response uh, of the European Union. We could discuss whether there should have been a response or not, but um, there's this feeling, and, and of course people feel disappointed, but they feel disappointed precisely because we have this European identity so much within our hearts that then um, it's, it's people that you feel mostly most close to that uh, they can disappoint you the most. Uh, so we've missed it, we've missed the, the use of soft power from the European Union. And more importantly, we feel that this non-response is a symptom of a bigger problem. As uh, Tony Jude used to say, for Europe to play part in the world on the scale of its wealth and its population and its capacities, Europe has to be united in some way. And he goes on saying, and Europe is not united. Indeed, this I would say is one of the key reasons why we are holding this uh, seminar today. Um, it is time to decide, and we've taken from uh, La Generalitat this very seriously, it is time to decide whether to move forward, whether to move backwards in the political union and in the integration process. I think it was Jean Monnet who said, uh, the European <coughs> Union is like a bicycle, so if you don't move, um, you just fall down, right? So, so it's still under construction. So we need to decide whether we go forward with the political union, but also we need to decide um, who do we want to design this political union? Do we want the state to design it, or do we, do we want to change and be the citizens that become key players in this project? In the aftermath of a recent global crisis, there's been a growing discontent towards the institutions where sovereignty has been deposited in the post-Second World War order. 
We have seen in the last years that this discontent is being used to fuel the rise of strong strongmen leaderships who are now challenging the very foundations of democracy and reshaping the global world order. And as in the rest of the world, in the last years, the EU institutions have proved, we could say, rather unequipped to manage in a satisfactory way the global economic, migratory, and also environmental crisis. And even more, the EU gave up on its internal political issues without even trying, sort of mediating in them. I'd like to refer to Peter Mayer when he said uh, in several of his articles, actually, that what Europe needs is politicization. So, so far, it's been this sort of sedated giant. I think it was Vivian Schmidt who said that. And he suggested that if we're not allowing opposition in the European Union, in Europe, within Europe, then what we have is opposition to Europe. And this is what we're actually seeing now, opposition to Europe, to the European Union, um, and to the European uh, Union institutions. We're very aware of this trend in Catalonia and would love to contribute to reverse it. Catalonia aspires to its freedom to govern better and more closely the affairs of their citizens and to do so by deepening democracy, extending the rights and freedoms and in the framework of a stronger Europe that can face global challenges. In this context, uh, Catalonia and its government has always advocated and championed for more Europe, more integration, more federalization and democratization. And here is where the Europe plan that uh, uh, the president mentioned uh, comes in. So from the government, we've designed a Europe plan, what we call a Europe plan, which is a sort of strategy for Europe, which started with a green book last year. It's actually been one year ago precisely now, this, this 20th of November, uh, where we exposed the preliminary vision of the government. Then we did a participatory process with uh, the citizenship, with the main actors. And uh, last week we presented the white paper. And in here we discussed, in the white paper, we discussed several um, topics that we think are of utmost relevance for Europe. One is whether we should go forward, forward in the political union and not stay only within the economic and, and monetary union. And how should we do that? Should we transfer sovereignty upwards? Should we also apply uh, more, in a maybe more precise way, the principle of subsidiarity? And we say yes to these two options. We want a more federal Europe, but especially European Union, that is not only a political, uh, a, sorry, a economic and monetary union, but also a political one. Our view is that we need to empower our citizenship and engage them in the process of constructing this European Union. We also talk about social Europe and we demand more social Europe, uh, both at a level um, of uh, concrete policies, uh, for example, the. Um, minimum salary, we, we make some of these very specific proposals, but also in the sense of federalizing social Europe or making a, in a way, a single market of uh, social Europe. Uh, we also uh, want a neighborhood policy which is transformative, which is citizen-led, uh, and we put a lot of emphasis in the Mediterranean because we are Mediterranean. Uh, so we talk about uh, a lot about the neighborhood policy. And finally, we talk a lot about uh, the global agenda. So the agenda 2030, the urban agenda uh, from the government of Catalonia, we are pursuing very actively these agendas and we want to make a change and in this respect. Uh, aside from the Europe plan, which you can see on the website, so if you put on Google Europa, Europe Plan Generalitat, it's the first one. Uh, we also have the Center for Contemporary Studies, which is led by, by Pere and also Riol Duran here, the Director General for Analysis uh, in, in, in our department. Um, and inside the center, we have the magazine called Ideas, Ideas, uh, which, in which we talk a lot about many issues, and especially we talk about Europe. Um, from we talk about from analysis and proposals to the creation of new stories, focusing on politics, democracy, economics, social perspective, uh, migration, and so on. And the last um, uh, magazine is the number 46, and it focuses on the future of the European project. So it's really 
it's closely related to this. And this seminar is part of an ongoing initiative of the government of Catalonia to bring bold ideas on how to reshape the European project to the Catalan public debate. So uh, here today in front of this um, most becoming audience, I wanted to reiterate our commitment in supporting the uh, vibrant European community in Catalonia. This government wants to make your voice and your expertise present in most pressing debates on the future of the European project. The EU, we think that the European Union should be contributing with fresh proposals for innovative government, go governance models. And um, I'll say that maybe it is Brexit time, but it's also the time for new sovereignties. And just let me finish by mentioning again Tony Jude, I just finished his post-war book uh, recently. Um, and he reminded us, history always happens to us and nothing ever stays the same. Thank you. And, uh, pardon, pardon. Yeah, le, paso, le paso la palabra para uh, una introducción al, al Paul Morillas, el director del SIDOP, uh, que nos explicará ¿no? lo que fan a Europa y el proyecto europeo. Gracias. Ay, perdona. Muchas gracias, uh, secretaria. She has posed a challenge to me because my notes are all in Catalan and she decided to speak uh, in perfect English, so I'll, I'll, I'll switch to Catalan if that's all right for our guests uh, and, and, and continue with our, um, to name some of the activities that we do from, from CDOP. Um, but that I will do it in English. For those who don't know CDOP, CDOP is a, is a think tank uh, based here in, 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 of course, in Barcelona uh, on international affairs. We are more sort of a global outlook uh, uh, think tank with the topics that, uh, that matter to, to, to the international society. Uh, more than a foreign policy traditional think tank, so we try to be as innovative as possible in, in studying all, all of the issues that we, that we deal with. Um, and we've been doing this since 1973, so it's the, the, the longest standing uh, think tank here, uh, of course, in, in, in Catalonia, but also in Spain uh, and also um, in most places of Europe, excluding the UK. Which, which you have a long-standing relations, uh, relationship with, uh, with think tanks. But uh, so much for the presentation of, of where we are. I ara sí que voldria agrair molt especialment al centre dirigit pel, pel Pere Almeda i evidentment a la Secretaria per la iniciativa de poder discutir una de les qüestions que crec que és fonamental uh, en, en aquests moments, no només per centres de recerca com aquest, com CIDOP, no només per la Secretaria i el Centre d'Estudis de Temes Contemporanis, sinó també per la societat en el seu conjunt, i és uh, tot el que té a veure amb el futur de la Unió Europea, uh, el debat sobre quin tipus de sobiranies uh, és capaç la Unió Europea d'absorbir uh, i, de, i de jugar Uh, en, el seu, en el seu entramat institucional i per tant és un tema que des de sempre uh, el futur de la Unió Europea, l'estat de la integració europea, els grans debats uh, en l'àmbit europeu tant dintre dels estats membres com en el conjunt de la Unió Europea estan uh, protagonitzant com deia, no només el debat entre experts, sinó també el debat públic i cada cop més, i m'agradaria insistir en això, cada cop més el debat públic. Um, jo durant la crisi de l'euro sempre feia la mateixa broma diguem, per, per explicar una mica i, i, i enumerar això, aquesta clara um, in, intenció d'entendre què és Europa preguntant si se sabia en aquell moment qui era el ministre de Finances grec i tothom ràpidament deia Varoufakis i ningú en tenia cap dubte, cosa que probablement fa 10 o 15 anys ningú hagués sabut el qui era el ministre de Finances grec en un país com aquest i per tant el fet que hi hagi major exposició a temes europeus és un primer senyal que la ciutadania Uh, l'import del que és Europa i l'import sobretot el, el futur d'Europa i per tant bona part de la nostra feina com a think tank és facilitar aquest trànsit d'idees des, de des del coneixement, des de la generació del coneixement expert, passant per evidentment les institucions però també intentant arribar com més possible a la ciutadania en el seu conjunt, a la societat en el seu conjunt que reclama coneixement i que uh, se'n beneficia i vol dir-hi la seva. Per tant, en el tema que ens, que ens reuneix avui, que és l'evolució de la, de la sobirania i, i, i com eh, Europa 
tracta aquest tema, jo crec que el president ho ha dit molt bé, partim d'una erosió de la concepció clàssica de la sobirania que cobreix tant el nivell cap amunt, supranacional, on evidentment la Unió Europea incideix en el dia a dia dels ciutadans de manera efectiva en moltes àmbits d'acció, com a vall també. I a vall també on hi ha nous actors, o no tan nous actors, però actors que reclamen part d'aquesta sobirania i reclamen poder donar resposta a moltes de les qüestions que, si bé originades en el nivell supranacional, si bé originades en Europa, acaben tenint una incidència clara en el nivell nivells més propers a la ciutadania i, per tant, això és a Barcelona i és a Catalunya i, a més, és en molts àmbits temàtics diferents. Per tant, hi ha una erosió de la sobirania en actors, però també hi ha una erosió de la sobirania en àmbits temàtics. Es parla de sobirania alimentària, de sobirania energètica, de sobirania en la gestió de les migracions, de sobirania econòmica, tots aquests aspectes que fan que també la sobirania sigui contestada des d'un punt de vista temàtic. I aquí a Europa com a projecte post-nacional, post-sobirà per excel·lència, on precisament dos dels elements consubstancials de la sobirania han estat cedits a entitats supranacionals. Aquests són la moneda per la zona euro i les fronteres per aquells estats que també les han eliminat. Li queda un dels espais de sobirania per cedir a l'exèrcit, encara amb moltes dificultats per avançar en matèria de defensa i seguretat a nivell europeu, però en tot cas emergeix com un projecte postnacional per excel·lència i precisament un projecte que posa damunt de la taula la necessitat de, davant de reptes globals, davant de situacions que s'escapen del control dels Estats membres, ser capaços precisament d'abordar-les en un nivell supranacional, moltes vegades i avui cada cop més, amb la sensació que si no ho fem en aquest nivell, poc ho podrem fer al nivell estatal perquè, com deia aquell, els estats europeus o són petits o encara no saben que són petits i, per tant, necessiten aquesta cooperació supranacional. No obstant, la Unió Europea a dia d'avui ens trobem en una situació de posar per endavant un projecte una mica en contra dels temps que corren. I el que més protagonitza avui l'escena internacional, quan parlem d'Estats Units, quan parlem de Trump, evidentment, quan parlem de molts països europeus, quan parlem d'Hongria, quan parlem del Regne Unit, quan parlem de Polònia, quan parlem de molts estats europeus, precisament el que hi ha és una tendència a refermar-se en els principis més de proteccionisme, més en contra de les institucions multilaterals, sent la Unió Europea una institució multilateral per excel·lència, un cert sentit de replegament que fa que sembla que aquesta idea post-sobirana, aquesta idea de reprendre o de refer la sobirania estigui clarament en contra d'aquests titulars que veiem dia rere dia a nivell europeu. I, per tant, aquí està el nucli de l'interès per nosaltres, diguem, com a centre de relacions internacionals amb una gran projecció europea, però també amb una voluntat d'incidir en les realitats que ens toquen més de prop. Tenim per davant, intentar entendre i contribuir amb la resta de centres europeus quina visió volem per Europa. I per mi, necessàriament, aquesta visió passa per tres punts principals i amb això ho deixaré. Durant massa temps, d'ençà de la crisi econòmica, però fins al dia d'avui, la Unió Europea s'ha dedicat sobretot a fer allò que en anglès es diu crisis management, és a dir, ha anat de crisi en crisi, ha anat donant resposta inclús fins al nivell dels consells europeus amb els caps d'Estat i de govern reunint-se, discutint l'última coma sobre el pla de rescat a Grècia, per exemple, o les quotes de refugiats a un nivell massa precís pel que haurien d'estar fet els caps d'Estat i de govern, s'ha dedicat massa temps precisament a gestionar aquestes petites coses, no poc importants, però petites coses quan ho comparem amb la big picture, amb el que és el futur de la Unió Europea i quin tipus d'Unió Europea hauríem de voler de cara al futur després d'aquestes crisis. I per mi ha de passar per tres punts principals. En primer lloc, ho deia la secretària, fer de la politització una oportunitat. És a dir, la politització sempre es considera, o l'acadèmia la considera, com una cosa que pot posar en risc, pot posar en dubte, pot fer perillar els consensos principals o pot ser reveladora d'un increment d'interès cap al que és la Unió Europea. I, per tant, si hi ha un increment de politització dels assumptes europeus, és també una oportunitat per poder cada cop més apropar-la a la ciutadania i que aquesta pugui dir la seva sobre el futur de la integració. Per tant, la politització, aquí ens decantem per no entendre-la com un fenomen negatiu que va en contraposició del que tenim establert, sinó més aviat com una oportunitat, com un fenomen que ens permet augmentar la voluntat d'integració i l'interès de la ciutadania per aquesta integració. En segon lloc, posant en marxa una lògica d'integració diferenciada cada cop més evident. 
ja no serveix quedar-nos obsolets o quedar-nos obstruïts per les dinàmiques constants de confrontació entre el mètode supranacional i el mètode intergovernamental, entre el poder dels estats o el poder de les institucions. Jo crec que nosaltres hem d'apostar clarament per una integració diferenciada que doni molt més pes a les ciutats, que doni molt més pes a les regions, que doni molt més pes a altres actors de la societat internacional que tenen una voluntat d'incidir, i evidentment aquí compto la societat civil, que tenen una voluntat d'incidir en el que és la integració europea, i això és un dels projectes que estem portant a terme ara mateix, i ho he dit, un horitzó 2020, que tracta precisament de la integració diferenciada, tenim l'Eulàlia Rubio aquí, entre nosaltres, com una de les investigadores d'aquest projecte, i la Blanca Garcés, que també hi col·labora, i que efectivament és un dels temes principals d'interès d'aquesta institució. I en tercer lloc, deia, crec que hem de tornar a una lògica de construcció europea no basada en un joc de zoom a zero, on moltes vegades els estats estan situats, és a dir, què hi ha per mi en aquesta negociació i si no hi ha res per mi que em beneficia a nivell nacional jo m'abstindré o, en el pitjor dels casos, bloquejaré aquesta decisió, i parlar d'una lògica transaccional, una lògica d'interessos compartits, on precisament, que és així com s'ha gestat la Unió Europea i com s'ha creat la Unió Europea, on precisament hi pugui haver una cooperació de suma positiva. És a dir, que allò que uns països del sud, per exemple, donen en matèria de de gestió de la crisi dels refugiats, altres països del nord puguin donar-hi en matèria de, per exemple, més flexibilitat en les ajudes socials, més capacitat de sortir de les regles estàtiques de la Unió Econòmica i Monetària i, per tant, entendre que Europa, si es construeix, és necessàriament amb la participació de tots i amb una lògica molt més de suma positiva i transaccional. Ho deixaré aquí i agraint un altre cop la iniciativa com a primers elements d'anàlisi en els quals aquesta institució, SIDOP, porta temps treballar-hi i amb la voluntat de continuar-hi treballant. I donaré la paraula ara immediatament a la primera keynote speaker del nostre seminari, que és Calipso Nicolaidis, que és directora i professora de Relacions Internacionals al Centre d'Estudis Internacionals de la Universitat d'Oxford, que ens farà una primera ponència i que seguidament serà comentada per l'Antoni Bassas com un dels pàrners d'aquesta iniciativa al diari Ara, a qui agraïm molt la cobertura que se n'està fent per fer uns primers comentaris en aquesta ponència, sense abans dir-vos que la Calipso Nicolaidis acaba de publicar un llibre, Exodus, Reckoning and Sacrifice, que el teniu disponible allà fora en una taula per 10 euros, 10 euros, best value for money you will get if you want to read her latest book. And thank you very much for your visit to CDOP and thank you all for coming. So Calipso, the floor is yours. Yeah, is it on? Which for me, frankly, would be the last think tank I would not know about. It is really a European beacon on the Mediterranean for us in Oxford. I like to call Oxford the Mediterranean on the Thames. So you're Europe on the Mediterranean and we join hands across the continent to think about the future of this continent. And I also want to thank um, Mirella and Pere for, for the Basque government, sorry, <laughs> Catalonian government and, and, and its Center for Contemporary Studies and the way in which think tank world and local government world indeed join hands to think about these intense nested issues of sovereignty together. And indeed, I, 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 I made a slip of the tongue because when I was landing from Oxford to uh, Bilbao yesterday and this morning from Bilbao to Barcelona, I couldn't help but feel like this guy, you know, who is lost in Africa in the jungle. And he um, knows that there's this huge conflict. And so suddenly he runs into a tribe and, there, and, and, uh, and the chief of the tribe looks at him and says, you know, are you with us or with the others? And the guy's really scared and he says, I'm with you, of course. And the chief of the tribe says, too bad, we are the others. Uh, <laughs> And so, you know, when you're a non-local, parachuted in a place where there is a divided society, where there is a conflict, you can't help but think and feel that, you know, you can't win because none of the sides are your familiar others. You know, I have my many familiar others, but 
you land in this place. And, and indeed, in, in spite of the fact that you can't win, I, I think I never learned my lessons. So indeed, uh, here in Catalonia, uh, um, I, I can't help but comment as another and, and be part of a debate that is a real European debate. It's not a local debate, as we were discussing with, with Tony a moment ago. Um, and, and indeed, to think about the fact, uh, well, in my case, with many other Europeans, you know, we signed petition calling for respecting the spirit of the rule of law rather than rule by law, and thinking about the fact that power uh, should never be abused, and all of these things. And at the end of the day, what is at stake for us Europeans, as we gaze on each other's conflicts and each other's tensions and desperate struggles to try to resolve these conflicts, uh, we can't help but see that there are at least, there are three theaters of recognition that interact. There is the theater really at the local level, two sides in Catalonia, two sides uh, in Britain, you know, two, two sides. And then in, in, there is the local level, and then there's Spain, Spain versus Catalonia. And then there is Spain overall versus the rest of Europe and the rest of the world. And my sense is that if you don't enter a spirit of recognition at any of these levels, you lose the recognition at the other levels. So everything that goes with recognition, listening to the other, trust, empathy, even if you stand on your own two feet, is connected in all of these theaters. And in a way, the conversation we're having today and around the theme of this workshop is about the interconnection between these different theaters of recognitions, between individuals, between groups, between countries. And indeed, for me, an image that truly illustrates somehow the challenge and the folly of it all it is, is this beautiful Icarus that I give you here on the slide and is, I'm proud to have in my book, which was painted by a very local painter, but a very international painter, Gabrielle Picard, who's here in the room. Um, and I understand, Gabrielle, that Icarus is a very Catalonian persona, as it were, not only because, after all, Barcelona was Greek once upon a time. You know, we Greeks, we were everywhere. Um, but because here's this character, you know, who, was, who dares. And it's folly, it's pure folly to try to reach the sun with wings of wax, but he dares. And yes, he falls, but if you don't dare, you never reach anywhere. And yet it might be childish, and maybe some will point the finger at Icarus and say, who was he to dare like this, a mere human? Um, so I think it's a good, a, a good image to get us started on this journey. Now, the journey that I, um, I want to take you on, as Paul very kindly introduced a moment ago, yes, it's, a, it's about a book, which I just published, but it's a book that, in a way, is very personal. This is me. After the referendum in 2016, I was very deflated, having been a very passionate rem Remain campaigner, as Mireya is a passionate European. Uh, and indeed, very quickly in this story, just so you know where I stand, um, I became a returner. That is, I, I didn't think it was the be-all and end-all to just revoke and reverse this result, which was a democratic result. You know referendum are democratic? <laughs> Can I say this here? Uh, and so, for me, the idea, and it has stayed with me, is that for us uh, Europeans in Britain, um, we, I hope that one day my kids, uh, my students, you know, the next generation will bring a changed UK in a changed Europe. And as you were describing, and as you describe in your um, the Europe plan and in your, all your work, you know, we all want to change Europe. Maybe we don't all agree on how it should change it, but we all want to change it. Il faut que ça change. Tu as raison. Uh, so we want to change this Europe, and for Brexit, it means for me, is it possible to imagine a smarter, kinder, gentler Brexit than the kind of Brexit conversations we've had in Europe today, where everybody's pointing the finger to the other side? We are in macho politics. My resolve is bigger than yours. That's mostly what these negotiations are about. And may I say on both sides, I say this to all the Europeanists in the room, it's not just the crazy Brexiters. And so I've been preoccupied by this because I think that only if we can manage 
a, a gentler Brexit, can we hope one day to see the UK return to Europe? And finally, therefore, here we are at a fork in the road. We are at a moment where I would, I suppose, you know, I'm not going to predict what will happen in Britain or in Europe in the next few days, months, and years. Nothing is harder to predict than the future. But probably we are at the end of Brexit 1.0, going to Brexit 2.0, to the future relation. What are the lessons to be drawn? That's kind of what I've been asking myself politically. The problem that's still me is that, you know, as I'm asking these lessons, I find myself in, in the position of Rorty's liberal ironist, who feels that her doubts, her hopes, cannot really be expressed in her traditional academic language, or even in her traditional other languages. And, and so um, I, I try to appeal to my different selves, and indeed, um, to the different selves of all the people I meet and all the divides we have in Europe, all the divides we've had in Brexit. Yes, with between young and old rurals and cities and north and south and poor and rich and all the rest of it. Uh, also, of course, I have to admit nobody's perfect. I just became British a month ago. So I, I feel torn but also drawn. I am actually a freakish French, Greek, British, three nationalities. Um, and it's it's I have started to feel very schizophrenic sort of being in this situation um, with these many belongings and many languages. But somehow, this is not what I'm going to talk to you about today. This is not what I want to talk about because that's what you've been reading in the papers all the time, what it will happen next. As I'm looking for another language, what do I do? I go back to him. Anybody knows who this guy is? Um, on his serves, I can help you here. He's just la lost all his men and all his ships in a, in a, sorry? It's Homer who talks about him indeed, Ulysses. Here is Ulysses between Charybdis and Scylla. And I want to take you to a journey with Ulysses and the other heroes that people his world. Uh, and indeed, Ulysses here is between the two monsters, as we always say, Scylla and Charybdis, and in, in, in in, in, um, in the Brexit situation, what you've had is Europe and British government, for better or worse, trying to navigate between hard remainers, no Brexit, and hard Brexiters, no deal, um, trying to find a way for this, this country, which you, know, you may disagree, but decided to leave the EU, to, find, to navigate. And, and in doing this, of course, encountering what we call in Britain and uh, unicorns, impossible feats. Um, and the problem with Brexit is that you have in Britain about a, a third of people who are hard remainer, a third of people no deal. And so together they are a majority, but they never act together. And so, but in a way, this distinction corresponds to a deeper distinction in Europe. And that is between really two fundamental forces, the forces of fusion and the forces of fission. Um, that's what really we have in Europe today. Um, and indeed, going back to mythology, forces of fusion are everywhere. You know, we somehow there is always a yearning for oneness, whether we are talking about Madrid or whether we're talking about Brussels. Unity, you know, it's like the hermaphrodite in Plato. You're always looking for your other half, trying to become one. That's one problem in Europe today, but of course we have also the other problem, the problem of fission. Because you know what? What is the meaning of crisis? So Paul told us brilliantly about the crisis that are uh, plaguing Europe. Well, you remember at the very beginning of the Iliad, bef way before Ulysses is, is, is all alone in the seas, trying to get back home, he's fighting, we have the fight between Achilles and Agamemnon. And that starts it all. That starts the big crisis of the Greeks. And what, is, what are they trying to fighting over? As usual, that's what guys do. They're fighting over a woman. Um, and this is Brises, and crisis is part of this story. And it is about the fight to share. What is the crisis about today in Europe? Is that we have forgotten how to share. We don't know how to share our wealth, our in income, but we also don't know how to share our hopes, our fears, risk, precarity. Some are in risk, some have everything. Somehow, 
We don't know how to share and you're up to them. That's the deep meaning of crisis. So if we start to, to think about how to address this crisis, what is at stake here? I take you back now to even earlier than this moment in the Iliad, even before the Greeks get on their boat to invade Troy. What happens? Well, we have our Ulysses. Ulysses is on this island of Ithaca, you remember, with his wife Penelope. Everybody knows this. And his little baby, Telemachy, has just been born. He's three months old. Ulysses knows that old Palamides is going to come from the Greeks and try to take him to the war. And he, com he conspires with his people and his wife and pretends to be crazy and sowing salt and sand on his fields and singing and plowing backwards. And Pelemides arrived and everybody's saying, oh, it's our master is crazy, he can't go to war. But of course, what does the old Palamides do? He takes baby Pelemachis, puts him in front of the plow. Ulysses stop, he's not crazy. Everybody realizes and the rest is history. He goes to war and Penelope cries for 20 years. She does more than crying. Usually women you know, pretend to be crying, but they do other things. Um, so what is this story about? What does Homer try to tell us here? with Ulysses. Well, I'll, my reading of this story is that actually the fundamental thing about Ulysses we learn at that moment is not just that the guy is the most cunning Greeks of all, the most courageous soldier and warriors. It is that he is ambivalent. You know, do I want to be a courageous warrior or do I want to be a, at home and build my island and, and, and plowing the fields? And so, you know, when we look at Europe today, and perhaps we believe that Europe is in part unheroic, maybe that's the problem with Europe. Who wants to die for Europe? But I think that its citizens, us in this room, you, we are actually what I think we are heroically ambivalent. Because it's quite heroic to be ambivalent. But in fact, most of us are ambivalent in life. We have mixed feelings. And indeed, the most fundamental way in Europe in which we have mixed feelings, so here, I, the case for ambivalence is, is I give you Machiavelli because he said very well that you, citizens have common sense and you, know, you should listen to them, Mr. Prince, but politics divides and creates this polarization and these conflicts and killing each other. And if in post-colonial studies, you find a lot of thinking about this, how the post-colonial subject both hates and loves its ex-colonizers. In many different fields, we can talk about ambivalence. But my point, perhaps in the book, but perhaps here today in, in Barcelona, is that in our politics today, we need to be able to tap back into our profound ambivalence, which allow us to at least listen to the other. And here I give you Citizens' Assembly when we demonstrate for uh, Fridays for the Future in London, this is a very recent picture, because I think that it's fascinating to see that how in Citizens' Assembly, people arrive on a Friday, they have very polarized opinion, and on a Sunday night they go home and they actually converge to the mean very often, or at least they understand the viewpoint of the other. And here in Europe, um, in, in the topic that occupies us today, sovereignty, and what is sovereignty at different levels of nestedness in Europe, our fundamental ambivalence is between two fundamental Europe, uh, nas uh, sorry, human instinct. The first instinct is obviously control. Taking back control is the most brilliant slogan ever invented for Brexit. Uh, but, you know, I know it very well. My, my dear daughter, Daphne, you know, every day she takes back control by slamming the door in my face of her bedroom. Uh, but nevertheless, she has the other fundamental human instincts, which is cooperation. She comes down and says, Mom, can I help you cook dinner, you know? And we all, I suggest, have a mixture. More or less we care about control, more or less we care about cooperation. But we all have a bit of both to different proportions. And so look at Ulysses, you know, when he is on his, uh, before he loses his ships, and he's on his ship, and he ties himself to the mast so that he wouldn't be attracted by or, or jump in to follow the songs of the sirens. What is the mast in Europe, if not the EU, its norms, its laws? We've all in Europe tied ourselves to the mast of our mutual commitments to shared value. This is what we mean by shared sovereignty. 
but we don't trust in our national and local instincts. We have to tie ourselves more or less to the mast. And yet, maybe just like the Brits, we might be tempted to break free in an ironic way because after all, it, the Brits actually carved this mask in, Euro in Europe, where at least when it comes to the single market and enlargement. So this is one of the ironies of Brexit. So the question then I ask you, I, I gave you some example of myth story to read our European predicament. And in the book I say in, in various places, you know, why do we need to use ancient myth. After all, they are ancient, archetypal. What do they have to do with our modernity? Um, of course, me personally, I was raised by a, a Greek dad in Paris who wanted to convince us that we were still Greek. And, and this is Calypso with Ulysses and with my name. You know, I did, for me, Greek mythology is in my DNA. But I am pretty sure that most of you in the room uh, also somehow. It's not just a Western thing because after all, myths are universal, and all myths in, around the world are variation around the same theme. And what myths do, what going back to mythology do, is I hope they, it's one possible other shared language in which we can have a more civilized conversation. Um, and the beauty of myth is that they have contingent meanings. They ask questions more than they provide answers. And they allow us for an ironic distance of modernity, so we can tell them and yet smile. So for me, myth is a language for mutual recognition, that kind of mutual recognition that I was speaking about at the very beginning of our conversation, or my monologue, but I hope will be a conversation very soon. Uh, and more, of course, more um, in the long durée, in a, in a larger way, myth are, are one of the fundamental questions in philosophy, all the way back from when Plato remember, distinguish between mythos and logos and say we have to go to logos and rationality. But he was a cunning guy himself because he uses a lot of mythos in his republic. And so for 2,000 years, philosophers have discussed the place of myth uh, in philosophy. And in a way, this is a variation on this theme. The book to help provide a kind of philosophy of loyal separation, I call it. And of course, people will say, well, myths are about history on testosterone. You know, there is lots of historical myth. But in a way, that's the background music. I don't really talk much about this in the book. I talk about archetypal myths. So this is the book, Exodus, Reckoning, and Sacrifice, because I find that these conversations have been organized around these three kinds of tropes, stories. <laughs> the book is crowdfunded. That's why it's so cheap. Um, because, well, because for me, this is a way of being part of the 21st century, and uh, crowdfunding is a way of signaling this is about the, the conversation. And there's been a lot of conversation with the supporters of the book. Now, in the beginning was the word, and the word was Brexit, but nobody quite knew what the word meant. And then the oracle spoke. Brexit means Brexit. <laughs> so the book is all about what means means, and Brexit means Brexit. And of course, unsurprisingly, I start in these archetypes with Brexit as Exodus. Now, of course, this is not Greek mythology, it's the biblical side, but there are echoes everywhere in all mythology of this very simple theme that, of course, Brexit is about an enslaved people that will be liberated from the shackles of Brussels. Um, this yearning for freedom, this yearning to say, let the people go, Egypt, Brussels, let the people go. So in that sense, you know, Brexit means that the UK will leave the EU. It's very simple, but it's not just a Brexiter discourse. It's not just the discourse of that which yearns to be free. It's also the discourse in the Brexit case, and I don't extrapolate to this country, of the other side, which says, well, this is the British problem. You guys created this problem. Deal with it. It's not our problem. So it's not always the, re the reaction, again, of the other side. But of course, you always have a story where a pharaoh does not want to let the people go. Now, indeed, in every kind of mythical story, what you find is that there is the simple story, but there is always the but. It's always more complicated than that with myth. And of course, we know very well that in Brexit, it's all about the wearing tribes. 
There are many tribes, and here uh, in CEDAW, but elsewhere too, we've all asked whether it's in Britain or elsewhere, what determines this divide? Is it geography? Is it demography? Is it sociology? Yes. Uh, but what we do know in the Bible is that there's a lot of chatter, chatter, chatter in the Bible, and they're very unhappy with Moses, all these tribes. And they say, Moses, what? why did you take us out of, of Egypt? We're very unhappy. And you know what, what Moses says literally in the Bible? He, he does say, keep calm and carry on. It's very interesting. Um, so, but of course, there's other ways in which, um, in, in which Brexit um, divides people. In, in, in Britain, but elsewhere too. And, and of course, empire nostalgia means that many in Britain do, our Brexiters do think Europe, yes, Europe is too small for them. So we do have these Brits, but we also have Brexiters who think Europe is too big for them. It's Tokyo, it's the Shire. They want to go back to their English na nation. So is Europe too big or is it too small? And then, of course, you have those who think that bond is the Egyptian house of bondage, and those who think that bond is the ties that bind. Sometimes in the same head, you think of those two meanings of ties. And, and, you, and you have all of these divisions. You have the question of you know, the chosen people in Exodus. How exceptional is British exceptionalism? We do want to ask this when we ask, well, will everyone follow Britain? And of course, in Britain, the island uh, country, um, they do believe to some extent that they are, maybe for good reasons. And maybe we can all agree that only Britain would dare, only these crazy Brits would dare. Nevertheless, won't we agree also that there's nothing less exceptional than exceptionalism? You know, every one of our country has their own narrative and story about exceptionalism. And indeed, who is inflexible? Why is Brussels, the pharaoh, Mad Madrid, you know, why this inflexibility of the center? And in the Bible, what is fascinating is the more you read it, the more you realize that the pharaoh is inflexible, not because he's so strong, but because he's so weak, because he feels vulnerable. And that maybe is something we need to understand about the Pharaoh that says, no, I won't let the people go. Um, and indeed, to understand the Brexiters, you need to understand this image, the leap of faith, when you say, oh, but it will cost you. Of course, losing supply chain of you know, making cars in Britain will cost you a thousand pounds per year. But you know, the Hebrews, they entered in the sea before the sea opened. It was a leap of faith. And for a lot of Brexiters, it's about a leap of faith toward freedom, whether we like it or not. And the, this is the Europeans that will get engulfed into their Red Sea, uh, the, their, their sea of red tape as they try to pursue the, you know, the Brexiters. Now, of course, we are left with this question. What happens in transition? Will there be 40 years of transition in the wilderness? And again, Brexiters have this biblical sense often that remember, you know, the tribes were not a people until the wilderness. The covenant is through the journey and the hardship. So maybe it's okay if it takes a long time. Um, but of course, in this story, there is also that of the promised land. Uh, what is a promise when the world is going to change anyway? You're not held to your political promise if the world change. So yes, the promise is about taking back control just like my daughter. But what does, you know, what does taking back control actually mean in an interdependent world? This is where we all ask, you know, what is the meaning, the material meaning of sovereignty? Maybe sovereignty itself, in a formal sense, is a value in itself. But who does it serve? To, and who is really taking back control? Who will, in the next decade, take back control in Europe? Um, and indeed, we can also ask, what is the strategy of Europe? Haven't we seen Europe in this game trying to say, look, this is not your promised land. This is your paradise, our paradise lost. And we are the ones who are the gatekeepers. But you know what? Isn't there sometimes some, um, some support for the one who bites the apple, the apple of freedom, the apple of knowledge, whatever that apple is, maybe it's poison, we don't know. And indeed, I ask in the book, and I ask myself, and I want to ask all of us whether, you know, yes, maybe we agree that the Brits are not trying to escape slavery, Brussels is not a prison, nor are they escaping paradise, 
the EU is not a paradise, not really. Um, but can we imagine the kind of Europe that Britain would not have wanted to leave? And for me, that Europe is inspired by the goddess, uh, the, the princess Europa, kidnapped by Zeus in, in, as a bull, who was not even European. She was from Asia. She lands in Crete at the limes of Europe because I believe that the soul of Europe is in its periphery, in its smaller states, in its limes, and that's the Cretan Europe, not the Christian Europe, that I think we could try to build together, but most Europeans don't somehow see it that way. And we can ask what it means to be the limes, that is, the neighbors of a Europe that is a regional hegemon. We can ask about the contradiction of a Europe which has a discourse of multilateralism, reciprocity, mutuality. That's the Europe that Mireya loves to, uh, loves to love <laughs> and that we love to love. And yet, it has no compunction when it deals with its neighbor, whether in the Mediterranean or in the East or tomorrow with Britain, to actually say, hey, you know, we're a regulatory hegemon. We impose our rules unilaterally. Take it or leave it. Sorry, guys. That's our power. We set standards in the world. Is there not a contradiction there? And isn't it fascinating that Brexit is making that contradiction visible? So, indeed, Brexit is about the slaves that, you know, built... In, why can't the pharaoh let go? Because, well, they built the pyramids. And the question will be, hey, you know, the Brits, they helped build our European pyramids. What will it mean for Britain to be a former EU member state? That is an animal that has never existed before in the international system, a former EU member state. We are going to have to imagine what it means together. And that is quite a challenge. So in Exodus, I end by hoping that if there is going to be a Brexodus, an exodus of Britain, Let's hope in an exodus light where, you know, Europeans are spared the plague and they are spared the, the, the voyage in the wilderness. But indeed, at the end of the day, I ask you, you know, is it sufficient to think of Brexit as exodus, their problem? Well, not really, and we know that. Because you remember, just after Brexit, I don't know if you felt the same way as I did, but I felt I used to live in the US after 9-11, after September 11, and, and for a few months before the Iraq war, everyone in the US was asking, you know, why do they hate us? Why do they hate us? Why do they do that? And I felt a bit the same spirit in Europe after Brexit. What's going on? Why do the Brits, you know, these great Brits, you know, why do they want to leave us? And so this is the second story of Brexit as reckoning, facing facing something, the tsunami of crisis that has engulfed Europe, that have left people behind, that have left people aghast with change. All of the stories that Paul was, and Mireya were talking about, and Anthony. So this is the crisis we've been, and maybe Brexit is a canary in the mine. And here I give you, who is this guy, anybody? Oedipus, remember Oedipus, who stabs his eyes to see the truth? A terrible truth indeed that, you know, he killed his dad and slept with his mom for 20 years. Not fun. But Brexit then maybe is about the question of who is going to stab our, our eyes in Europe to see some sort of truth. So here, Brexit may mean that everyone should leave or partially leave or think about leaving. That's the reckoning story and all the endisms that go with it you know, about our geopolitical place in the world, our geopolitical solitude, um, about our form of capitalism that we are trying desperately to reinvent. Um, and, and indeed, uh, the question then becomes, you know, what truth, can we agree on those truths? Maybe we disagree on those terrible truths that Europe has to face, just like Oedipus faced all sorts of truths. Um, and, and Paul was talking about Varoufakis. Well, there was the German truth and there was the Greek truth. Um, but have we started even thinking about what it means for our Europe? And who determines the consequences? You know, Macron says, il y aura des conséquences au Brexit. But who is the God up there who says what these consequences are? Who reads the treaty? Who has that authority? Who is the interpreter? You know, for the Greeks, the gods were actually their conscience. But what is our collective conscience, our collective European id that reads these consequences? 
Um, and here is the story of Troy because that whole story of Ulysses and the voyage of return that is so difficult is all because, of course, these Greeks, they rape women and uh, kill kids and all of that. And they are going to have consequences. That's why they can't get home, um, says Zeus, aka uh, uh, Macron. Anyway, the and then the question, of course, that we ask here and we ask together is whose sovereignty is at stake in this European debate? Because yes, you hear from here, I hear that you hear a lot that this is about, Brexit is about national sovereignty, uh, voting against Brussels. But many more uh, Brexiters actually voted against London through Brussels than against Brussels. It was about voting against those elites who seemed to conspire together in Brussels and across capital, keeping citizens out. Brexit is at least as much about popular sovereignty as it is about national sovereignty. Or at least it forces us, and this is what we're going to do in the conversation of the seminar, it forces us to think about the relationship between national sovereignty or regional sovereignty and local sovereignty and popular sovereignty. At which level can citizens best exercise their equal dignity, their equal democratic dignity, their popular self-determination? Is it in the city, in this region, at the national level, at the European level? Well, Europe hasn't shown that it was at the European level. So this is certainly something we need to reinvent. And, and indeed, the problem is that when some try to reinvent it in a rather intense way, saying, let the people go, we want to do it our own way, whether it's in Catalonia or whether it's the Brexiters. And I know that this parallel is controversial. We can discuss it. But then, of course, the gods in the Olymp, uh, in the Olymp will say, this is hubris. How dare you? How dare you, Prometheus, give the fire to the lowly citizens, to the humans? You know, in Greek mythology, those with hubris are always punished, and yet we kind of feel some angst for them, you know, just like Tantalus was punished. And of course, Ariadne, my favorite, you know, the godmother of me too, who weaved the, all the rapes of the gods and, you know, was punished by being transformed into a spider, or indeed, Gabrielle's Icarus, the most hubristic of all. So what do we do with countries, individuals, county regions that have hubris? You know, how is Europe capable, is Europe capable of accommodating its exceptionalism and its hubristic, um, beautiful, effervescent diversity? That's a question Europe must face. And so at the end of this part, yes, I, I, I um, try to give a vision. Maybe, maybe when we talk about sovereignty in Europe, we need to take in hand that there is many more transformative Eurosceptics than existential Eurosceptics, existential who say we don't want the EU at all. But in the Eurosceptic movement, there are those who want to really radically change and indeed implement subsidiarity, not as a, as a vague technocratic kind of uh, criteria, but as a true fundamental criteria. So how do we do that? How do we embrace transformative Euroscepticism? And at the end there, I, I ask, well, maybe the vision for taking back control, stealing the, 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 the slogan for the next generation is about taking back control of our future. And one of, the big, my, one of my big advocacies these last few years has been that I hope that the EU can pivot from a politics of space to a politics of time. And, and, um, and maybe if we do that, m maybe it will inspire again the new generations. We can talk more about that. Now finally, very, very quickly, um, because I know that my time is up. There is a third version of Brexit, which is neither Brexit as something that's British or something about reckoning about our past or our present. It's about this moment. Brexit as sacrifice goes back to Bereshit in the Bible in Hebrew, which means in the beginning. And in the beginning, what you always have with humans is human sacrifice or animal sacrifice for the sake of something. And in this story, then, the third meaning of Brexit is that the UK leaves in the EU in order to save it. A very French version, but a very Brussels version, too, of Brexit. You know, ces Brexiteurs qui ont toujours un veto, ces Britanniques qui, qui empêchent l'Europe d'avancer. Okay, so we get rid of these headaches. What is it? Uh, 
Mosca? Mosca con, con ojera. We are having a semantic debate. Um, mosca con ojeras. So, you know, let's get rid of these headaches and let's advance Europe. And of course, we hear this a lot these days. New beginning for Europe thanks to Brexit. But, and of course there's always a but in every story. First of all, that you see in this painting that we, what we know, there's always an escape goat. If, we don't know if Iphigenia, who was sacrificed for the Greeks to go to Troy you know, on the altar, we don't know if she's gonna be dead or alive. There's always many versions to this story. And, but more importantly, you know, all of this yearning and all this Brexit story and all of our stories here, they happen against the backdrop of heroic sacrifice. Men and women who in, in the past have struggled for our freedoms. I think the body politics is all the scars that we still have from these stories of struggles, which we tend to forget. And of course, in the Brexit case, you heard the voices on the radio of the soldiers in 1418 and all of their stories. And that was the background music, a hundred years of memory. So yes, you can talk about sacrifice, but it's not a heroic sacrifice, guys. It's an ironic sacrifice. Always look at the bright side of life. You know, and the Brits are really, really good with irony. You should listen to all of the really comedy shows about Brexit. I'm not sure you get enough of them here in Spain um, about Brexit. <laughs> no, it's a bad word. Um, and so, you know, then we are left by the end of this story with more questions. If you really see Brexit as sacrifice, you know, it's usually sacrifice for control, yeah. You know, controlling the weather, controlling something. But in this case, what, what really are we going to control? What is it that you want that you can really control by reasserting your, your local space? And maybe you can control, but maybe there are different things you can control at different levels. And of course, the EU, uh, why is the EU sometimes ready to sacrifice the relationship? Because for the EU, it's always in the name of principle, the Bible. And we can come back to these principles. And to, to a certain European dogma, when we talk about the indivisibility of the four freedom, it's just like the indivisible trinity. You can't touch it. Um, and yet, well, we could debate it. And of course, then if, I, if you ask me, how, how can we use this metaphor of sacrifice? I ask, could Brexit be viewed as a great experiment for Europe? Maybe a really self-reflective sacrifice which forces us to think about what Europe is all about. Maybe we can remember that in many civilizations, you know, when societies are in huge conflict because they have mimetic desire, as René Girard, the philosopher, said, you need a scapegoat to recover your unity. And these days, maybe Britain is our scapegoat. I don't really like scapegoats at all because we're in the 21st century. But ask yourself, why is it? Mireya said earlier, isn't there anything more important than unity in Europe? And then I ask you, why isn't there European unity when it comes to Xi in China, when it comes to Trump in the United States, when it comes to Sisi? when it comes to all of the great geopolitical challenges of the world, but there's absolute unity and we're super proud of it when it comes to dealing with Britain, one of our member states. Because perhaps Britain is the perfect scapegoat, dispensable enough to be sacrificed, but precious enough to be sacrificed meaningfully. And so I ask you, you know, what, what does it mean to sacrifice on the altar of unity? And maybe, maybe, you know, it can be sacrificed this Britain for its moral influence when it has left so that we keep in Europe the best of Britain, which is its pluralism. And we all need, and I'm speaking as a French and as a Greek, not as a Spaniard, although I have Spanish great grandparents, but I think all of our countries actually need a little dose of British pluralism. I also believe that, and this is the topic that our previous speakers were raising, Europe will be agonizing in the next few years about what I call exit interrupters. How differentiating must we be in order to keep other countries from exiting? And we will maybe, if we are mature enough, think of Brexit as something that will allow, you, allow us to create a beautifully inspiring precedent for a very deep relationship with a third country. Not a horrible precedent that shows that 
Europe is falling apart. But that can be done, and I can say more about how, but I'm sure m many of you can think about this too, because of course, Spain is a very close country to Britain. And finally, I think the greatest gift of all from this sacrifice is what I call demonstrative sacrifice. The idea that, of course, if Brexit happens, it will demonstrate you can leave the EU, that the EU is not a prison, that it's not the US 1865, that it's not a nation state, because we know that nation states, just like the one we're in today, do not have prenups. Their constitutions don't say how you can get out. That's almost, the, by definition, uh, the definition of a nation state, except the one I live in, the UK, but then on the other hand, we don't have a constitution. So, states, so the EU, Brexit will show that somehow the EU, Brexit means that you can leave and therefore you shouldn't, because if you can leave, you shouldn't leave. And that's the great Brexit paradox. And you know, this, I bring you, my poor self again, which is very schizophrenic about this, because as a political scientist, I think it's beautiful to show that Europe is a community of freedom, a community by choice. But of course, as a European citizen and a, as a freakish citizen, French, Greek, and British, I, I really don't like Brexit, so I'm schizophrenic. And indeed, being schizophrenic, I see this story from all sides, and I invite you to see the story from all sides, because that's how we can rebuild trust from all our sides. Maybe, just maybe, Britain will be a scapegoat in Europe that allows us to somehow recover unity. But you know, maybe it won't be a scapegoat like this. Maybe it will be a jumping goat that will be happily ever after. But then the other side will say, well, yeah, it may be jumping, but it's jumping over a cliff, so what are we going to do? And of course, the cliffers will say, no, 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 no. We're going to just jump on the bridge and go to the bigger world and be free in our global Britain. But we Europeans will say, no, we will turn the bridge around, bring you back to Europe, to a Europe that is united and that is dancing together, including the Brits, and reweaving like Penelope the ties that bind so that indeed one day our kids can build, bring back a changed UK in a changed Europe. That's it for my sovereignty moment. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Nicolaidis, for this brilliant talk. Uh, we are running a little bit short of, uh, of time, so I have a couple of questions as a media partner. Uh, by the way, thank you very much for inviting Gara to be media partner of this, of this event. Uh, so I have two questions, like uh, one as a media and uh, one as a partner. Um, as uh, something you said, you ask, who wants to die for Europe? I, my answer was refugees, migrants. Is, this, is that, uh, I think it's a sad uh, situation. Um, that um, remembers me um, something that George Steiner said once, or wrote such, uh, uh, once. Um, the phrase was, the day uh, that uh, the Holocaust happens, um, Europe commits suicide. Do you think that refugees crisis mm, says something similar to Europe nowadays? Tony, I think your answer is in your question. <laughs> and having talked with you earlier, I believe that. And also because we're here in Barcelona, which is one of the many reasons why I, I love this city, many reasons, is indeed its stance on the refugee question and its offer to become uh, you know, a host country, a host city, like others, and um, and the promise in that gesture that perhaps we can invent in Europe a way of dealing with refugees that are re that is really pluralist and decentralized. You know, in Oxford, we I'm part of a sanctuary network for refugees, but the state is the gatekeeper. We can't access refugees somehow as citizens unless and until our state says yes. And of course, it's very much the case here in Spain too. So indeed, you are right. Um, uh, we have a kind of Holocaust in the Mediterranean, 5,000 deaths every year. Sometimes when I swim in Greece, I think of it very intensely, and I feel, how can, how can that be? Uh, how, how can we c 
continue to look at ourselves as citizens when we know that. So we each do our little bit. But the only way in which we can change this is to you know, change our politics. And of course, it has to do with, with refuge. It has to do with the great value of hospitality that is very much at the center of Greek mythology. You know, Zeus was the god of hospitality. Um, but of course, even Kant didn't, didn't say, you know, hospitality is simply opening your doors to everyone. He thought very hard about what it, what it actually means because you have to have the capacity to be hospitable um, in a real deep sense. So how do we develop this capacity? And yes, to, to, it is about what we do here and now in our cities and towns and in our homes. But it's also how we change our states, but it's also how we work with, for instance, the Marrakesh Declaration on Circular Migration. You know, we, we can't help but think about these problems at the, on a global scale uh, where, you know, re refugees, you know, don't have to leave in the first place. And of course, we all know this is a much, much bigger conversation. Sure. Um, actually, for, for uh, migrants and for refugees, Europe is a paradise. It's a uh, it's curious, no? Uh, the second one is as a, as a media. Uh, do you see any relationship between uh, Brexit process and Catalan independence process? Well, above all, I want to send this question back to both the panel and the Catalan uh, government and uh, everyone in the room. Um, and I must say, you know, I'm very proud to understand some Catalan because, you know, with the French. Um, and of course, indeed, I think you could hear me say it throughout the presentation. And it, it's a question that obviously deserves many yeses and many noes. Uh, and how these two relate is complicated. And, men, the, and I know that, I mean, it, I find speaking to friends and colleagues in the Basque country and here that it's a difficult parallel. It's, it's, a, it's a one that is very hard to wrap our head around because, of course, these Brexiters, aren't they xenophobic and close on to themselves and nationalistic? And aren't we Catalan, you know, worldly, cosmopolitan, open city, open to refugees and all of that? Isn't our nationalism a different kind of nationalism? Well, yes and no. I mean, isn't there in common several things? First of all, the yearning to take back control. That's kind of 101 of any secessionist movement, and Brexit is a secessionist movement just like the Catalan one is, absolutely. On, and also the pharaoh, what you find on the other side, the extent to which, you know, yes or no, do you find a pharaoh that is somewhat inflexible, that believes that law, the written law, whether it's a constitution or the Treaty of Rome and its variations, somehow make sometimes come before you know, the li living society that needs to actually have laws and constitutions that are spaces to organize our freedom and our living together. That's all a constitution and a treaty should do. And you also have a situation where you have self-anointed interpreters of the Bible, the law, the treaty, the constitutions. But who are these interpreters and who decides who decides? And who accepts the conversation about who decides who decides? So yes, there are all these parallels because these are all similar movements of yearning. Now, once you've said that and you've accepted this basic pattern, then we can have a very long conversation about how these are also different. Indeed, they start by being different because, because the very idea of Europe is upside down in these two stories. And, that, and yes, in the yearning for, we have a British yearning for freedom, or rather an English, because it's very English, it's not Scottish, it's not Northern Irish. So it's an English yearning for freedom that has something to do uh, with a rejection of an ideal of, a, of a, a, a union on the continent. Whereas we heard from the panel um, that somehow, yes, in Catalonia, the yearning for autonomy or independence or the variations in between somehow always connects back to Europe for historical reasons, because after all, there was always this hope that Europe helps us against our own states, state. But of course, you know, sometimes the forgetting how Europe has let this, this part of the world down several times, you know, um, and the Basque country similarly. So sometimes I'm, I'm surprised by how uncritical 
you know, these movements uh, can be vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. Uh, but that aside, uh, I, yes, definitely there is a sense that Europe is the hope of region, is the hope of cities, um, and that somehow that's... But I ask us ourselves, isn't that a dreamt Europe? You know, since when do regions and cities have a voice in Brussels? We are not there yet. And you can say, well, yes, but, you know, it will happen. Or you can also say, well, yes, but Europe makes us more powerful vis-a-vis -vis the, the rest of the world. Who are we, you know, here locally to act vis-a-vis -vis China? You can say all of this. But nevertheless, I think that Europe that we can dream of, that the Brits would want to leave, and that the Catalans and the Basques still believe in, you know, is, doesn't entirely exist. And it's for us to invent it and reinvent it all the time. So I'm sorry I didn't give you a simple answer. But I do think that the parallel between Brexit and the, Catal the movement in Catalan and still the situation in the Basque country, and indeed the reinvention of federalism in Spain, but also in Belgium and all over Europe, you know, all of these are part of the same question of how we create unions in Europe that truly respect the autonomy of its members, of its component, but that these members have to earn their autonomy and the way they do this is by being radically open to each other. That's, that's the price of freedom. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure that there will be questions in the room, so uh, someone has to be the first. I think that they prefer coffee uh, or <laughs> coffee break or... Uh. Yes, hello, Calypso. I think it's been very inspiring, all your presentations, because you have explained uh, very complex political concepts with uh, a lot of precision and combining with a deep metaphoric and mythological uh, ideas of our culture that uh, really helps to understand today's complexity. And when I was listening to you, uh, I was feeling like we are still very attached to a very rigid concept, concepts that shape the, the, the modernity, no? Concepts such as nation state and sovereignty, but that we all know that uh, in today's world they are not working anymore and that it's like we are fighting over an empty castle that once we get there we'll find that there is nothing there, no? that the world is working uh, in another way. So we have to uh, uh, step aside of classical concepts as such as sovereignty and start using shared sovereignty probably and, and breaking uh, the, the, the breaks of this castle or of, of these all concepts and moving towards uh, new ideas, new political concepts that really helps to, to, to deal with uh, 21st century challenges. So we have to be inventive and innovative in political science, basically. What do you think about this? Well, indeed. <laughs> and, and, you know, one of the... Uh, ways in which we'll be forced to be inventive is new technologies. I mean, we can't rest on our laurels, uh, at least my generation, you guys are younger, uh, so you, you, know, you understand these technologies better, but I see it with my kids and my students. We see it in the protests in Barcelona and in Hong Kong, you know, how technologies help people mobilize in a certain way, but it's also about how they will help us have our democratic conversation. There are people who think about, you know, artificial intelligence avatars who will help us collectively make decisions, not like the Chinese. The Chinese have a whole different notion. They think they're inventive. They think they're going to reinvent democracy as a huge, big quantum computer and artificial intelligence that will make the optimal decision for very happy, happy Chinese. Now, that's a different kind of imagination. But I think we in Europe need to be showing ourselves that we can think long term, that it is urgent to think long term, and that you don't need a five-year plan, that in fact a five-year plan disempowers people, and that people in China do not own the future, even if their government pretend that they can forecast and, and make big plans. So for me, that reinvention has to be about the capacity in the present to think longer term and to have technology help us 
reinvent democracy. That, for me, is the next frontier. There are many things to say about that, but your generation knows it better than I do. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent lecture. I, w I was reflecting on the comparison be between Brexit and the Exodus, and uh, I was wondering um, which Red Sea, I mean, <laughs> Who is trying to, to cross the Red Sea today, if the Red Sea is a channel, as is the British uh, trying to come back from Brussels, or the migrants trying to go to, to, to Great Britain that the, U, the British will not let in? Or is uh, uh, the Red Sea the, the river Tweed that's between uh, England and Scotland uh, that the Scots are trying to cross and that the, let, the, English, will not, uh, the English will not let them out? So, uh, these issues uh, show, it seems to me, that the uh, Great Britain today is uh, the point of concentration of all the tensions that the multi-layered system of sovereignty that is gradually emerging uh, are creating, that is tension between national sovereignty and European sovereignty, which forces you to, to let in people you don't want to let in, and tension between national sovereignty and local sovereignty that, um, that emerges for the, the British, if they want to leave the EU, they will be forced to let, they may be forced to let out people they don't want to, to let out. So don't you think that the Great Britain today is uh, the point of concentration of all those tensions around the, a new kind of multi-layered system of sovereignty that is emerging? Uh, in, in, sorry, what's your name? Emmanuel. Emmanuel, if you are French. Oui. oui. Uh, uh, indeed, and that's in a way the book is three meanings of Brexit, but it's about Europe, it's about our world, and indeed when I talk about reckoning, it is the idea that Brexit is a canary in the mine. It's just a, a it tells us more about all the problems and challenges that Europe is facing. And you're absolutely right that you know Britain is trying to leave one union by breaking up its own union in Britain. Uh, and if you have, if you poll the Tories, uh, to Tories voters, not a majority of Brits, they even think it's a price worth paying, which is fascinating in and of itself. Um, that leaving the EU is a, it, a breaking up as a union is a price wor worth paying. Um, so they think very hard about the relationship between these unions, um, and those who actually think no, 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 Bre Brexit will help us strengthen our union. Um, will also be in a paradox because they will have to start thinking about the relations between the parts in the same way as we have a single market and a union that has to have mutual recognition between standards and movement. A lot of the discussions inside Britain sound exactly like discussions inside the EU. And they're learning that because, you know, Brexit is a pedagogy. It's a pedagogy for the Brits, it's a pedagogy for Europeans. Suddenly, we're all learning more about what is at stake. So I completely you know, agree with your metaphor. Thank you, Professor Nicolaidis, for your thought-provoking uh, presentation. I wanted to ask you, you, you mentioned in your presentation that Brexit could yeah. be an ambitious external um, project in the sense that um, it could foster cooperation in, in the next phase of Brexit, in Brexit 2.0, um, with the existing uh, tension between Europeans and the Brits. And, uh, well, personally, I'm of the view that Brexit should carry on because, as you said, it was a democratic uh, decision, no matter how much we can regret it. Uh, what steps do you think can be taken in order to foster this cooperation or agreement in the next phase of Brexit? Well, I think every member state, but therefore all of you who are from Catalonia, you know, every bit of every member state should uh, contribute to a thinking which is really leaves behind the, the idea of punishment, even if it's usually de de denied. The idea that somehow Europe, how we avoid other, I mean, others leaving is by being tough on Britain and show how cold it is outside the house. Um, what is a Europe that will be a, attractive to its citizens because we're so afraid to leave? Is that the Europe we dream of? 
No, I think a magnanimous Europe, which says, okay, yeah, our member states decided to leave, one of our biggest one, you know, it's really sad, we're still sad about it, but let's make the best out of it, and let's realize that in this bigger world of ours, in this, we have this very intense geopolitical solitude of, as Europe. Yes, we are a declining continent. We are actually close to 5% of the world population. We have to work together as all Europeans, not just EU members. And that's a geopolitical necessity. But we cannot kid ourselves, and the French are very good at kidding themselves, that we could have a very problematic trade relation and still geopolitically, in foreign policy, be united. Macron really thinks that. He thinks that he can tell the Brits, give me your helicopter to carry French soldiers in Mali, French neocolonialism, uh, and I will also take your bankers from the city to Paris. And, you know, those two things are compatible. Well, they, they aren't really, because there's a political mood music. And if you're not working together on trade, on the arrest warrant, on all sorts of justice and home affair, all the other areas, you're not going to work well on foreign policy too. It's going to create noise in the system. So for me, my ideal of Brexit is indeed that A, we realize as Europeans that our geopolitical unity as a continent requires that we have a good social economic Brexit. And how to do that is for Europe to accept the fact that um, we can't deal with Britain as we deal with Ukraine, or as we deal with Morocco. Um, that is that what, what we've, all of us who've worked on the neighborhood, and Mireille, I know you have too, you know, and, and others, you know, where we do action plan and tell other countries what to do, you know, that's not gonna work with the UK. Instead, we need to recognize that there, there are very, very few member states in Europe among the 27 that are more compatible with EU laws than Britain. In fact, Britain has been the most EU law-abiding country of all member states, and now it has internalized, be because of the Withdrawal Act, all the European laws. So it's more European than any European member state. That's the great, one of the many ironies of Brexit. If you start from that starting point, and say, okay, yeah, Britain might diverge a bit, but in, you can't, in the name of potential diversions, overlook this fundamental compatibility. So for me, the re future relationship has to be about the fact that we remain compatible in terms of broad values, but also in terms of specific standards. And frankly, I do not believe, as a Franco-Greek living in Britain, that this will be Singapore on the Thames and a deregulatory country. I don't think British society is there, that they wouldn't take it. Um, so I think it's a bit of an exaggerated fear in Europe and that it's actually very realistic to build a very ambitious future relation. How many questions do you have? Uh, two questions, okay. Three, lunch. please, let, let's put together the questions and then w you, 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 a little bit, yeah, the answers. So the first one. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Simon Tubo. I'm at the University of Nottingham. I wanted to pick up on something that you mentioned in your really impressive and, and, and fascinating presentation, uh, which is about the way in which inflexibility is tied to vulnerability, and you had this picture of the pharaoh. And that's something that interested me because I found that in a lot of the cases that I've studied, whether it's Brexit or, or the Catalan issue, this, you, you have uh, groups which are uh, apparently self-confident, but which um, display some inflexibility which may uh, belie some lack of self-confidence in their identity, because that self-confidence depends absolutely on recognition, that we, we depend on external recognition in order to feel that we are being um, in order to exercise our, ident our identity and to feel respected. And that's something that's quite curious. People who are self-confident, one might presume, don't necessarily have to depend on recognition. So that's a little bit the, my, my sort of, uh, my paradox, I guess. And I, my, my following question is, if mutual recognition is so important, and you've written about that in the case of standards uh, in the EU, but also in the case of uh, the pluralism of, of, of national identities and, and democratic styles and institutional diversities and so on. If that has been so important to the European project, 
why hasn't it permeated below the state level? Why do we see it as, as still a nation state mutual recognition system and not something that goes uh, much further? Thank you. Uh, Patricia Garcia Duran from the University of Barcelona. Sorry, what is your first name? Patricia. Patricia. Uh, magnificent, as always. And uh, my question has to do with, I was surprised with your mentioning the role of the US and the, we'll say the Brexit towards, shifting towards the US and that uh, appears to be also there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paul Tyler. Um, I'm British, I live here. <clears throat> I'm half Greek, and my wife is French, so I feel we have a lot in common. <laughs> I loved it, I loved all the mythology. It was a, a great presentation, I'll be buying your book. Uh, thank you. I wanted to ask, people talk about Brexit as though it's happened, but I think one thing that's underplayed here is the real possibility of a second referendum. If the Tories don't get a majority, there's a real possibility of a second referendum that might be won by the Remainers. How is Europe going to respond to that? Will they, will they throw us out anyway? Is it, is it a done deal anyway? Thank you very much and go ahead. I mean, all of these questions are about the conversation that we're going to have at Over Coffee <laughs> because they're huge. And, and Sam, I mean, um, I asked this question, we asked this question and here, Ender and Christina are here and many friends and colleagues. You know, it's a question we all agonize over how these different levels of recognition, you know, relate to one another. Because, of course, recognition is the secret to, uh, you know, a healthy democracy. And what is the pathology of Europe today? It's not so much some, we need some magic bullet in Brussels and have more power to the European Parliament. All this is very artificial. The key to everything is the health of our national democracies in each of our countries. And, and indeed, um, when you have upheavals like, like here, yes, you, the, the question is what is happening to the elites of our countries? And you know, yes, we have populism that is an anti-elitism, but we have different kinds of elitism. You know, we have extractive elites. Extractive elites materially because they extract the wealth or they extract the power that they have inherited from decades and they want to hold on to it. And that's why, you're right, Sam, they feel illegitimate for better or worse. And, they, uh, and therefore, they barricade themselves within the institutions that have frozen their power. Um, and so the question becomes, you know, to how do, do those dynamics evolve within our countries? Indeed, well, only through struggles. I mean, how else do democracies change? You know, they can be democratic traditional struggles through the ballot box, they can be through voice, they can be through civil resistance. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we are talking, I mean, mutual recognition has to be earned. Recognition comes from struggles of recognition. We have scars on our social body from these struggles and they belong to every country. Then the next question is whether and how, what happens across countries to, to empower them? Uh, and what can Europe do? What does Europe do? I mean, sadly, and here I am a great European idealist, but sadly, often Europe itself contributes to freeze existing power relations. That's the reality of the Europe we have today. There are other forces. It does also empower minorities and progressive forces. It does both. That's why Europe is schizophrenic. Europe is about democratic empowerment and about democratic suppression at one and the same time. So if we internalize this schizophrenia of Europe, I think ourselves as European citizens have to be kind of constructively schizophrenic as, on, as to how we, and we do that, I say we in this room, because I think we're not the extractive elites. I think we, think tank, local governments, you know, academics, we are the defiant elites. At least that's how I like to think of us, you know. Well, we're not that rich, right? So anyway. Um, and so, Patricia, the role of the U.S., I mean, all of these conversations, of course, are in the shadow of the transatlantic relations and what is happening to it before Trump, of course. But Trump makes a huge difference. What would be Brexit without Trump? It would be a completely different story. Um, 
So, and, and uh, in a way, Trump is good news because I think tr for, for, for those who believe in European Union to the, and for a Britain that says close to Europe, because it's quite obvious that since the beginning of this story, you know, every time we've had an international challenge, whether uh, it was in Britain with the poisoning or whether it's global climate change or in Bolsonaro, whatever it is, Britain is always on the side of its European partners. Always. Not, never with Trump. And when poor Boris has to stand with, next to Donald on the tribune and have a press conference, and Donald said, yeah, sure, we'll buy the NHS. You know, I buy anything. I buy the towers and the NHS and whatever. I and, you know, five minutes later, he has to eat his word because Boris, you know, tells him, look, I won't be reelected if you don't deny what you just said. So, you know, he's been more of an embarrassment than anything. All the, and, and that's, you know, but that's the moment. Now, I think structurally, structurally, the question will be with us as to whether and how you know, Britain saying, Brit the Europeans in general uh, will indeed carve, you know, a place for themselves in this new, bad new world that we're in, um, uh, indeed. And maybe this is time. I mean, I am part of those who still continues to believe that, you know, we, 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 we still the transatlantic trans community, um, but, Nevertheless, you know, this, will, this is Europe's moment uh, where we really are seeing how um, I indeed the euro for me is, is been extremely lethal as an economic instrument. And, you know, I'm Greek after all, but it is a geopolitical asset. And when you see what is happening with Iran and in fact even with China, you know, this is, this is going to be the, the moment where we have to decide and show that we can act autonomously from, from the U.S. Doesn't mean against the U.S. and bigger discussion. And finally, my brother Paul <laughs> Taylor. Uh, um, indeed, it's very nice to meet another freakish um, in this room. Um, and uh, yeah, 50-50, we might have a second referendum. They're, they're really two different very different second referendum that could happen. You know, you could have a scenario where um, the Lib Dems and Labour together form a government. Um, and, and in this case, you'd have a very strange moment where Corbyn has promised to negotiate a new deal that will be really uh, encapsulated by the idea that Britain, for so many years, was in, almost out, and for Corbyn, it will create, it will be out almost in. That's the kind of, you know, Brexit that Corbyn wants. And that many Remainers, you know, have, that's our second best, you know, maybe. So he'll negotiate that. And it will not be too hard because Brussels will kind of love it, yeah. Uh, but what kind of choice will it be for British citizens to have this, you know, this kind of super sub Brexit versus Remain? That, uh, um, and first of all, it will be very bizarre because then the, the Labour Party would actually campaign against its own deal. That's a bit surreal in politics. And, but secondly, you will have half the country with, that will feel disenfranchised because that's not, they, they won't have a, a voice. So you could imagine a second referendum where a majority votes for Remain. After all, we might, we might as well go for the real thing. But with, you know, much lower absolute figures. And this is a, a whole big question about democracy. Is it about percentages, absolute? you know, who gets mobilized and who feels that their voice has been heard. And then there's a second refer scenario where actually Boris Johnson needs the Lib Dems to, and as a price, he, he, um, they say we need a confirmatory vote. So that's remain against your deal, the Boris Johnson deal, a relatively hard Brexit, although, mind you, we don't really know because the political declaration is very vague. And, um, and there again, you know, absolutely, the polls show two things that are very fascinating for anyone who's interested in democratic theory. One is the, the so-called death curve. So last spring, the two curves cross. That is, if you just assume that nobody changes their mind in Britain, but just the people who voted Brexit die, have died, and, and the young people are now voting, getting to be 18. Uh, just simply for that demographic evolution, we've reached a stage where there will be more than 
more remain than leavers. And then you add to this who changed their mind and how, and it makes a complicated picture because there's about five, six, seven, eight percent of leavers who become remainers because they see the mess and all of that, they've learned. On the other hand, there's almost the same numbers of remainers who are staunch Democrats before Europe file. That is, they believe we should honor the referendum even though they're still for remain. And so if you take all of this and mix well, it's basically another huge mess and huge uncertainty. So I'm never going to predict what will happen next. Sorry, Polos. So, Calypso, uh, muchas gracias. Eucharistos, uh, thank you very much. Gracias, uh, coffee break.